uh, can head out. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome here this morning. Uh, those of you that are live, you, those of you that are joining us online, it's always great to worship together. And so if you don't know, we are in week number three of our series, Jonah, which we've titled God's Heart for Humanity. And I will do another plug. Uh, if you guys are not yet in a life group, I want to challenge you to get into a life group, even though the book of Jonah is only 48 verses. Uh, I cannot unpack them all here on Sunday morning, and so get into a life group. You can go a little bit deeper. You can talk about some of the different things surrounding the text, and so that is my plug for life groups. If you're not in one, talk to Pastor George, talk to Pastor Josh. You can even talk to myself. We want to get you plugged in. And so this morning, I've titled the message Somewhat Obeying, and uh, I'm hopefully in a little, more, little while we'll see why we call it Somewhat Obeying, because it does say Jonah goes, but but Jonah, like Lauren said in his prayer, is very relatable to all of us because he's somewhat re obeying, maybe reluctantly obeying. And so we'll get to that in a few moments. And so, again, even though the story of Jonah, I want to remind you, I want to remind me, is about Jonah's God. There, there are so many things that Jonah does, says, that we can relate to. And it's amazing that, that, that God still works through this reluctant prophet. And so... Before we get to Jonah 3, 1 to 10, where if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. If you have a pew Bible in front of you, page 754, that's where we're going. Um, I always challenge you to open your Bibles because I don't want you to think I'm just make, making up this text and doing whatever I want. You can follow along with me and see it as well. But before we get there, I just want to ask you the question, you know, when in your life has God called you to do something and maybe you did it reluctantly, right? I'm not asking you if you ran away, but Maybe God has called you to do something for him, and you, you've been like Jonah, you've been the reluctant person saying, God, I'll do it, but maybe your heart's not in the right place. Like, I know in week one, we said God wants those who are called to follow that call, but, but when has God called you to do something and you did it reluctantly? You see, this is the reason why I love the book of Jonah is because, man, so often I say Jonah is me, um, and maybe, maybe you might say that too as you read it, but... You know, I was a runner, and sometimes I still feel like running. Sometimes I'm selfish like Jonah is, but sometimes I'm reluctant in what God calls me to do. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, you know, early on in my life and the call that God had for me, I told you about God calling me into ministry and how I ran from that. I've told you once before how God called me to camp, and I tried to run from that. And following coming out of camp, when God has already showed me that, you know what, he has great things in store for me, and even when I try to run from him, he can make some amazing things happen. Um, God, on my year home after Bible school, after working at camp, God called me to work with Awana Ministries. If you don't know what Awana Ministries is, it's little kids ministry. It's midweek clubs, and um, our church was running midweek clubs back in the Paw, Manitoba, and um, my cousin Daniel was ahead of them, and they, they were starting to get too big that our, our small church building, because my church building back home that I grew up in is nowhere close to the size of this building. It's a small church building. Could no longer hold the amount of community kids that were coming out, because the majority of the kids that would come out to Awana Ministries midweek to learn about Jesus were community kids. And so we, we rented out the middle school, and my cousin Daniel's like, come help with Awana Ministries. And I'm like, I don't like kids. I, I say that nicely. Like, I'm, I'm, I wasn't a big kid person. I'm really awkward around kids even now that aren't my own. Like, I, I, I can socialize with kids. I, I want to encourage them and stuff like that. But I'm still awkward around kids. It's the truth. And you're like, Darren, I thought you said you worked at camp. Yeah, I was awkward around kids then too. That's the reason why I wasn't a camp counselor. Because if I had to spend 24-7 in a cabin with a kid, oh, I would have been insane. And so God's like, hey, no. I want you to come and work with, with these kids. And I'm like, God, I don't, I don't want to. Like, I don't want to. And he's like, haven't you learned anything from trying to run? And I'm like, what? You know, and I tried to come up with excuses, but, but I knew I couldn't run from it. Like, I, I just learned that lesson. You think, you think I'd be able to figure this out? But I just learned the lesson. And so I reluctantly showed up at Awana. And at Awana, we had this girl. I don't know if she was in grade three, four, three or four, two, three, four. I don't know. She was young but she was evil. Like, that's what I, I was saying nicely. She, she, she was, I, I want to say she was mischievous to say it nicely, but man, there's the things this kid did and said. And the funny thing is when I say that, and even as I was thinking about that this morning, that's the way I was when I was young. And so maybe that was my issue with her. I saw myself in her. But whenever you would try to give lessons, because all I had to do at Awana was come out and lead games and listen to kids recite Bible verses. That's all I had to do. 
That was, that was my role. But whenever I tried to lead a game, she'd be yelling all the way through it, right? I'm trying to give, it, I'm trying to give instructions. She's bouncing off the wall. I say something to her, and she's like, I don't care. And it's like, man, like, no, go away. Like, I, I was struggling with this kid. But you know what? She just kept on coming out. And, like, I'll, tell, I'll set the stage of the way she was. My cousin liked to do games around the themes of what we were doing. And so I, I don't remember if it was week one, two, three, or four. He was like, we're talking about trust today. So can you and your brother come up with games for trust? And I'm like, yeah, we can figure something out. And so we put bags on their head. Don't worry, they were paper bags. We had those back then. And so we'd get, we'd get them in groups of two. And she was with her friend. And her friend had a paper bag on her head. And they were sort of race around the square. And they're sort of learn about trust, but they're sort of do it fast because it is a race and no one likes to lose, let's be honest. We all want to win. And so this girl is leading her friend and they go around the corner, they come around another corner and they're going straight. And all of a sudden I see this kid with her friend. She's leading her friend straight into the bleachers and you can see this smile of glee on her face. And so I run over, I'm like, stop, stop, stop. And I get them to stop. And I turn my back for a moment after I position them to go the right direction. And then I hear this big thud. And this girl is laughing and pointing at her friend. And I'm like, God, this is the girl that you want me to work with? Really? Really? And week after week, she just kept on coming back. And I'm like, God, are you ever going to get through to her? And, and again, week after week, she kept on coming back. She started learning memory verses. And, and God had some amazing things in store for her life. You see, God sometimes calls us into ministries, calls us into situations, places, and maybe we don't go in with the right heart, but God can do some amazing things because he is the one at work. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up to Jonah chapter 3, 1 through 10, and we're going to take a look at Jonah, that reluctant prophet going into the city of Nineveh, and we're going to see what God does through him. Because it is God at work. I want to remind you of that as we read this here this morning. The book of Jonah has the character Jonah in it, but it's about Jonah's God, the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this is what it says, Jonah 3 verse 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from greatest to least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, And how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion, and he did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Let me just pray with you. Father God, I thank you that you are a compassionate God. I thank you, our God, that still shows compassion to us today. And so God, I ask you in your compassion, in your love, in your mercy, in your grace, speak to us today. Show us your heart. Help our hearts to be open to what you have to say. And God, I pray that what we talk about today doesn't just become head knowledge, but becomes heart knowledge, and it transforms the way that we live. As I pray every week, God, what you want me to say, let me say. What you want me to forget, let me forget, because God, it is your word that transforms. It's not what I say. And so I thank you that as your word goes out, your your, your scripture says it will not come back void or empty. And so I thank you for the work you're doing in all of us, including me, in advance. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so the book of Jonah, only four chapters, but there's a lot we can navigate through it. And like today's message, I could probably spend an hour and 50 up here talking about different aspects of this book. However, today, I'm going to try to keep it simple because the truth is, depending on how you read the book of Jonah, you can have different takes on what happens here in chapter three. So depending on how you believe the genre to play out, you're going to interpret this chapter in one light or another. And so for this morning for me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take the book of Jonah 
chapter 3, and I'm going to take it as historical narrative. Right? In the, like I said before, maybe we read this story and there's parts of the story that seem unbelievable. The fact that everyone put on sackcloth, including the animals. Maybe there's parts of this story that you're like, a whole city repents. Even God's people can't repent. What I want to remind you is what I need to remind myself when I read unbelievable things in the story is simply, it's about God. And my God can do far more than what I can ever imagine. Trust me. My imagination only goes so far. God is infinitely more powerful than me, and he can do great things. And so as we read it this morning, we're going to look at it as a literal historical narrative of this is what happened in the great city of Nineveh. So this morning, God's heart for humanity. God's heart for humanity, the way I look at it here this morning, is God wants to use us, imperfect people, to help others follow him. That's what he wants to do. And I know it's not easy for us to hear that we are imperfect people, but we are imperfect people. Everyone has issues, right? God wants to use us. And so this morning, that's what I want to start with. If if you know Jesus as Savior, if you know him as Lord, you have given your life to him, he wants to use you even though you're imperfect. You see, when we look to the scripture, God calls Jonah to go, right? Right? If you read the story of Jonah, we know Jonah is disobedient, Jonah's a runner, Jonah is sinful, Jonah is selfish, Jonah is somewhat depressed at times, and Jonah, like us, as we read all of last week, this chapter, sometimes he only clings to God when he's in trouble. At the start, he seems like he's running from God, he's in trouble, he's facing death, now he's calling out to God. But God uses imperfect people. And right here in verses 1 through 3, it says this after Jonah gets vomited out onto the land. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city, a three days visit. Jonah now starts to somewhat obey God. And I say somewhat because next week we'll take a look at the way Jonah responds to God's compassion, to his mercy, to his love. But here's the thing I need you to know here this morning is God wants to use you. He wants to use me, even though we don't have it all together. I think there's something in our mind that says one day when I have it all together, then God can use me, but he wants to use you now. I know I've used this before on a Sunday morning, but I'll use it again and again because as we read the scripture, God uses imperfect people. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was depressed. Moses was a stutterer. Zacchaeus was short. I don't know how that comes in there, like... You're short, you're bad, you don't got it all together, right? Is that, is that a curse? I don't know. But it always comes up in this. Abraham was old. Uh, again, I don't know that one either. Lazarus was dead. And then always attached to this whenever you read it online or if you saw it before, it's simply the truth from 2 Corinthians 12, 19. My grace is all you need. My power is at work in your weakness. You see, church, I need you to know we don't have it all together and that's okay. And if you and I are waiting for perfection, to go and follow the Matthew 28 command of therefore go and make disciples. Guess what? We're going to be waiting the rest of our lives. Yes, God has saved us and he has declared us right with God, but we are still in the process of being sanctified. At least I know I am. I'm in the process of each and every day, God working on me, working on my heart, working on my selfishness, working on my pride, And so I want you to know this. Don't wait for perfection. God wants to use you now. Do you believe that? Do you believe God uses imperfect people? And if you believe that, I want to ask you, where is God calling you to go right now? Where is he calling you to go right now? Is it it into your school? Is it into your workplace? Is it into a government agency? Is it, is it serving downtown with Ruth and Naomi's or serving at Big Brothers and Big Sisters? Is it, is it making yourself visible in the community by serving on your neighbors? Like, where is God calling you to go right now? 
Because even though you and I are both imperfect, God wants to use you. And not only does he want to use us wherever he's calling us, he also wants us to share his love with someone. And so I want to ask you, who is that person? Who is that person that God is speaking to you and saying, hey, you know what? Even though you don't have it all together, I want you to go to, and I want you to share what I have done in your life, how I have saved you, how I have transformed you, how I keep you going each and every day. Who is that person in your life right now that God is saying, I want to I lay this person on your mind. I want to lay them on your heart. Is it a coworker? Is it a friend? Is it an aunt? Is it an uncle? Is it someone at school? Because here's the thing, God uses imperfect people. I know this because God uses me and I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect. I need Jesus each and every day. So I want to ask you, do you believe this and will you say, yes, God, use me. Use me. Jonah's not perfect. We've seen it all the way through the story. We'll see it again next week. Jonah's not perfect. But we follow a perfect God who is saying, I want to use you. I want to use you for my honor and glory. The second thing I want to say here, God's heart for humanity God's heart for humanity is, is to use us imperfect people to help others follow him. And give me a moment, I will get there. God wants, through his Holy Spirit, to give us the words to say and the hearer the ears to understand. Just give me a moment, right? God's heart for humanity is, is for us imperfect people to help others follow him. And the way he's going to do this is he's going to use his Holy Spirit to give us the words to say and he's going to give the listener the ears to hear. You might say, well, how do you get there? And I'll get there in a moment. But one of the biggest objections I hear from people when I say, hey, you know what? Who is God calling you to share the gospel with? Who is God calling you to share Jesus with? We always say, what happens if I mess up the words? What happens if I don't know what to say? What happens if I say the wrong thing? And so we start to psych ourselves out. We start to say, I can't go and share the gospel. I can't go share about what Jesus has done in me, through me, and around me, because guess what? I'm going to mess it up. And let me tell you this, I believe with all my heart, God will give you the words to say, and he will give the person you're talking to the ears to hear. So you might say, well, how do I know this? Well, here is Jonah's original call. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 2, Jonah is called by God, and God says to him, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before him. And so, so God goes to Jonah, he says, I'm going to give you the words to say. I want you to go to Nineveh, a city of great importance to me a city with people created in my image and in my likeness. I want you to go there, and I want you to preach against its wickedness. So Jonah's given the words of God. This is what you're supposed to go do. What does Jonah do? If you were around in small groups, if you're in small groups, you would have watched maybe the Bible Project video where he goes and he pre preaches his five Hebrew sermon, his five Hebrew word sermon on repentance. And this is what he says. He says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's five words in the Hebrew. See, see, Jonah goes, and you're like, what happens if I mess it up? Now, we don't know if Jonah is intentionally trying to mess this up, or he believes this is what God is saying to him, but, but he goes, and, and there's things that are missing from Jonah's message to the Ninevites, all right? First and foremost, well, great, you're a man coming, coming here saying we're going to be overturned. Who's going to overturn us? Oh, you're God? Well, Jonah says nothing about God in his little, in his little message to the Ninevites, well, what have we done wrong? Well, Jonah doesn't say what they've done wrong. But God said to him, go tell them about their wickedness. You see, there are things that are missing, and we don't know if Jonah does this intentionally or unintentionally, but he goes and he preaches 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. And then he goes outside, and he waits for its destruction after three days. Enter the Holy Spirit. Enter God at work. You see, I truly believe that if we are faithful, if we are faithful, and we know that God has saved us from our sin, that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and we, we have that head knowledge, when we go to speak to somebody, we're not going to mess up the words, because guess what? It's the Holy Spirit at work. And you might say, Darren, well, how do you know? 
How do you know God's going to give me the words to say and those that are surrounding me the ears to understand? Well, the reason why I know is because we're not the first ones to come up with this excuse. God, I don't know what to say. God, I, I, I blabber. God, God, God. We come up with these, all these things. We're like, God, I can't do this. Go back to the book of Exodus. Moses, as God calls Moses to go before Pharaoh, we see this conversation in Exodus 4, 10 to 12. Moses says to the Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. And this is what God says to him. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? It is not I, the Lord. Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to speak. Do we believe that when we hear from God and he tells us to go and speak his truth to whoever he has on your mind, that he will give us the words, words to speak? And if you don't believe me, we go a little bit further into the book of Luke, Luke 12, 11 to, 11 to 12. We'll get to that about in a year and a half in our Gospel of Luke series. We're slowly plugging our way there. Yeah. So Luke 12, 11 and 12, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking about the fact that, you know what, one day you are going to be brought in and have to give a reason. And it says this, And when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Church, do we, do we believe that God is going to give us the words to speak? God gives Jonah the words to speak. He goes in. He speaks something that, that he might think in his heart is going to be the end of Nineveh. Forty more days and then you're going to be overturned. But, but God is at work. God's spirit is at work and something amazing is about to happen. I know in, 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 your, in week number one in your life groups, you would, have, you would have heard if you were there that that word overturned can be looked at in a couple different ways within the Hebrew. And one of the ways that, that we can look at it being overturned is like we find in Genesis 19 where it's the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's one way that you can look at that word overturned. But another way that you can look at that word overturned is, is the transformation of. The transformation of the heart, the transformation of the life. And we see that in 1 Samuel 10, 6, where, where, where Samuel goes to Saul and he, he's ordaining him for ministry and he knows that, that Saul's life is going to be radically changed by the Spirit. And so this morning, I want to ask you, do you believe that, that God's going to give you the words to say because all of a sudden, Jonah's in there and he's saying, you know what, this place is going to be overturned. And the Holy Spirit starts to work. He starts to work, and in a few moments, we're going to see what happens when God is at work. You might say, Darren, well, how do you know it's God that's at work? Well, let me tell you how I know it's God that's at work because here's the truth, I can't save anybody. I can't, I can't save you from your sin. I can't save you from your separation from God. Just like you can't save the people you love from their sin, from their separation from God. It's only Jesus Christ that can save us. And it's only through the work of the Holy Spirit as, as he calls, as he beckons, as he moves, and people respond and receive. Jesus says in John 16, 8, he says, when he, talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. It's the Holy Spirit that's at work. And so I want to ask you this morning, I want to ask you this morning, do you and I, do you and I believe that God will give you the words to say and those that you are called to share him with the ears to hear? Do you believe that? Do you believe that your God's big enough to do that? Well, I do. I do. And I think once we start believing that, guess what's going to happen? We're going to lay down our fear we're going to lay down our doubt. We're going to lay down our excuses of why we can't go and share. Because our God is bigger and he's at work. And when his spirit works, we're going to see what happens. As we continue on, in Jonah 3, 5 to 10, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work. God's heart for humanity. Church, I want you to know this. God's heart for humanity is for, for him to use us, imperfect people, to help others follow him. 
God used Jonah and he wants to use you too. First, I was going to use a paraphrase, but I just want to read this again because I think it's, I think it's so beautiful what happens in the city of Nineveh. And I just want the word of God to speak to you and me this morning. But starting in verse 5, it says this. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them from greatest to least put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Even though Jonah doesn't say, hey, you know what, you guys are being destroyed because of your wickedness that God told him to go tell the Ninevites about, somehow, as the Holy Spirit works, guess what they realize? They realize, let everyone give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And then verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. God is at work. Church, the same God that was at work in Nineveh, the great city that he loved, is at work in the world today. And there are many people living in wickedness and in evil ways, and he wants them to turn. You see, what we see here in the city of Nineveh, it's true repentance. And I know for us so often today we say, well, repentance, that must be an awkward word to say. No, repentance is simply turning from or returning to. So when we say repent to somebody, it's not like this evil word or this taboo word. No, it's it's saying to people, you know what, turn from wickedness. Do you know what wickedness has the power to do? Wickedness has the power to do only one thing, destroy. That's all it has, right? Jesus says that in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he has the power to do. And so God wants people in our world to turn from their wickedness. I know it doesn't sound palatable because we're like, oh, I don't want to offend somebody that they're wicked. No, no, no. We all need Jesus. We all sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. And so to repent is to turn from wickedness, turn from evil ways, turn from things that are separating us from the best life possible and returning to the ways of God. Turn from, turn to the ways of Jesus. Or if you want to look at it just through the lens of return, return to the relationship that you and I and everyone was created for in the Garden of Eden before sin. Church, repentance happens in the city of Nineveh. Repentance happens to the city that is important to God because everyone that is created in the image and likeness of God is important to him, a.k.a. spoiler alert for next week. They repent. And here we have this imagery of them putting on sackcloth. I know we don't do that anymore, but this idea of putting on sackcloth was taking this goat's hair garment and it would be minimal dress, very short for everybody. And it's very uncomfortable, I've been told. I've never worn one, trust me. But uh, it's just a symbol of repentance and mourning. And it was, it was huge in, in and all around the ancient world from Judah to Israel to Babylon to Assyria. They repented from the king to the peasant. And here's the thing. When you read this story, it has to be a God thing. You're like, well, how does it have to be a God thing? Because when they hear it, they quickly say, let's believe God, let's fast, and let's repent and put on sackcloth. And guess what? This isn't a Moses Pharaoh thing. Nowhere in the story does it say, as Jonah goes through and preaches in the great city of Nineveh, he goes before the king. No, it it says he even just talks about this for one day and then continues his journey. We don't know if he did it on the second day or the third day. But God is at work, the Holy Spirit is moving, and all of a sudden it goes from peasants to common people up to the king, and the king says, I want everyone to repent. I want everyone to put on sackcloth to show mourning for our evil ways, for our wickedness. 
and we're going to put on that sackcloth that will represent this imagery before God, and hopefully he'll relent. And I know we chuckle at this because sometimes we read this and we say, even the livestock have clothes on. But I was learning as I was reading, in the Persian Empire that comes after the Syrian Empire, they actually put sackcloth on their animals in a time of repentance. So not a time of repentance, a time of mourning when one of their kings died. So this isn't an uncommon thing for that time period. But we read it and we chuckle at it because we're like, ah, this must make it untrue. No, no, this is how sorrowful they were for their wicked ways. And if you want to read about how wicked the Syrians were, go ahead and read about it because they were not good to their enemies. They weren't nice people. And the Holy Spirit cuts them to the core. King hears, and it says, when the news reaches the king, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, and he covers himself with sackcloths, and in the dust, he puts out a proclamation. He steps out of his throne He goes out with everybody else because he realizes it doesn't matter how powerful he is in the eyes of the world, guess what? He's just like everybody else. Destruction's going to happen unless he repents and turns from his evil ways. Church, I ask this nicely today because I ask it to myself as well. Where in your life do you have sin that you need to repent of? Where in my life do I have sin that I need to repent of? Like I said, you know what? We all have issues. I wish, I wish with all my heart that the moment I gave my life to Jesus, I became perfect and I had no more issues. But on this side of eternity, guess what? I have to choose Jesus each and every day because the world is battling for my soul. And so I want to ask you, where in your life do you have something that you need to repent of? Maybe it's for the first time you need to get down on your knees and say, God, I have been the God of my life and today I give it all to you. I need you to be my Lord. I need you to be my Savior because what I'm doing right now is not working. Or maybe you've already given your life to Jesus as Savior and Lord, but there's a sin out there. Maybe the sin of idolatry, of anger, of boasting, of conceit, of coveting, of deceit, of division, of jealousy, of pride, of slander, of lust, of anger. Like, I, I, I don't know what is your thing that the devil's trying to use to attack you, but is there something in your life that you're like, man, I... I need to turn from it and I need to return to God and just be in his arms and say, God, you know what? Take that away from me. Right? Maybe it's the the God of idolatry and when we turn from that, you know what we learn? That God is better than any God of this world. When, when maybe it's the God of, of deceit or the sin of deceit and you, here's the thing, God calls us as followers of his to be people of truth. Maybe it's anger and God says, no, I want you to love. I want you to have the fruit of the Spirit flowing out of you. See, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I I know I need Jesus every day. I know every day I need to get down on my knees and say, Holy Spirit, fill me with your fruit because I want to get angry for dumb reasons. I know every day I got to get down on my knees and say, God, you know what, help me because there's days that I want to be selfish and not serve, and I know you've called me to be a servant. I know there's days in my life when, yeah, sin comes up and I'm like, God, I I don't want to give in, but I'm not perfect and I choose to do something dumb and so then I have to repent. Repent's not a bad word. It's for you and for me to understand that, guess what? We need to turn from the things that bring death and destruction and turn to the things that bring life. John 10.10, the thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life to the full. We need to turn to Jesus and his ways. It's not easy because everywhere you look, all the advertising of our world pushes us in the opposite direction. And we need to say, no, Jesus, I want to to choose you. I want to choose your way. And so, despite what the world says right, will will you say, Holy Spirit, show me where in my heart there are things that you want to clean up. Because God is at work in our lives, and he wants to make us more and more like him. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to pause there, and I want to challenge you this morning that God's heart for humanity is simply, he wants to use you and me, imperfect people, to help others follow him. Do you and I, do we believe that? Do we want that? Do we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus?
So as the worship team comes forward, I'm just going to simply go from Jonah to Jesus because I'm glad Jonah is not the perfect example of a God that has made us and loved us, but Jesus is. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so from Jonah to Jesus, I want you to know this as we look at today's chapter, Jonah's heart was for himself. And if you don't know this, Jesus' heart is for everyone. John, 16, John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And I'm so thankful that God's heart is for everyone. From Jonah to Jesus, Jonah did not want to tell the Ninevites what to do to be saved. Jesus came, and we read it in Luke 5.32. He came to call the sinners to repentance. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He wants everyone to come to him. From Jonah to Jesus. Jonah was hoping that the wicked Ninevites would be destroyed, and I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that Jesus looked at us in our wickedness. He looked at us as we were broken, as we were rebellious, as we were running away, and he laid down his life for us. We need to remember that. We need to remember what Christ has done for us. Ephesians 2.5 says, even though you were dead because of your sins, he gave, us, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by grace you have been saved. So church, I just want to challenge you to think about what Jesus has done for you and for me. And even though we're not perfect, he's calling us to go and help people follow him. Here at River of Life Church, we exist to help people. We're here to help people. Because guess what? We can't save anybody, but Jesus Christ can. So this morning, as we make it practical, I want to give you a few things. Again, it's not about weighing you down, but it's thinking about how to take this from head knowledge to heart knowledge and actually live it out in the week to come. It's simply the first and easiest thing is just being open daily to allow God to use you even though you're not perfect. Right? We all, we all have issues, so we got to be just open and say, God, you know what? I'm going to let you use me. Second thing is ask the Holy Spirit to eliminate the fear of saying the wrong thing and ask him to help you believe that he's going to give you the words to say and that person that you're talking to the ears to hear and understand. Third thing, ask the Holy Spirit simply, will you show me, is there any sin in my life, something that's keeping me separated from you, something that is actually destroying me, destroying my family, destroying my relationships? And if there is, let me, let me give that up to you and choose your ways. And lastly, ask God this week to bring someone to your mind who he wants you to go and tell him about. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you that you are at work. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is at work in this world, and it's not my job to save anyone. It's not my job to, uh, to say everything perfectly so that people can understand, but it is my job to say, God, let me hear what you want me to say, and as your hands, as your feet, as your servant, I want to share you with other people the best I can. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're at work, and you're at work here today. And I pray that if there's someone here today, someone watching this online, someone watching this online in the future, if they're not at a right relationship with you, where they don't know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that today they will turn from their wickedness that really is just bringing destruction into their lives and turn to you and find life. God, I pray that for those of us here today that know you as Savior, that know you as Lord, if there's something in our life that is keeping us from that fullness of relationship with you, that you will just chip that away, that you will chisel it away. God, it's going to hurt because we try to hold on to the earthly things as much as possible, but we know, we know your way is better. And so I just pray, I just pray that we will choose you in your way, that we will lay things down at your feet. And God, for us followers of you that have said yes to Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can speak you in boldness, in love, in compassion, in kindness, and that those that we're speaking to will have ears to listen. And so God, as, as we move into a time of response through, through song, I pray that as we sing, I surrender, Lord, that we will surrender all to you because we need you. I need you. I know I'm not perfect and I need you every day. And so I just pray that we all will realize who we are in you and how much you can use us. In your name we pray, amen. As we go back into uh, worship through song. <clears throat>